getting in. Um, so just a brief run through of today's schedule. Um, we're going to introduce both of the organizations, um, Anaka Network and Somali Academics. Then we're going to move on to the hot seat discussion from the panelists. Then we'll enter, um, open up the floor for questions from the audience um, and then close off um, with a short intervention from Hadal uh, where they'll provide some mental health tips. Um, so just some housekeeping points, please remember to keep your microphones on mute. And if you have any questions um, or any issues, feel free just to drop those um, in the chat box and then we will um, respond to them accordingly. So now we're going to move on to the short introduction um, on Anaga Network by myself. So yeah, hi, um, I'm Kule and I'm the founder of Anaga Network. I am based in Geneva this morning um, and I work for the United Nations. I'm an international trade and development professional who actually kicked off her career in finance. So I've worked in London as well um, and Qatar um, in Islamic banking um, and investment banking, in Islamic banking and <laughs> investment banking as well. Um, so I launched Anaga Network back in January of 2020. It was such a phenomenal first event. Um, that we launched in collaboration with the LSE Somali Society. Um, so where did the idea come from? So Anaka Network was really founded with the vision to connect um, Somali students and recent graduates with Somali professionals. Um, so when I moved to Geneva in mid-2018, I was at a point in my life where I think everyone gets to that point when you're young, <laughs> as tough as university is, I think post-university is arguably even tougher. Just had kind of graduated my master's program and I was working on a um, grad scheme in the UK, which I had then quit. And so inevitably found myself job searching. Um, then I applied for this role um, with the WTO um, to help actually Somali as accession. So their application to join the organization. And from there, I met this phenomenal trailblazing Somali woman called Marian Hassan, who at the time was working for the Somali government and connected with her and she really took me under her wing and she mentored me um, and I definitely would not have been able to build out the career that I've built out here without her support. Um, so that's one of the reasons I launched this, but also now that I found myself, I've kind of like set up some good roots here in Geneva. I'm the only Somali actually working in trade. It's quite a small sector, um, but considering how entrepreneurial Somalis are as people, it's quite sad to see that there's no others um, kind of occupying this space. So that was really another reason that I launched the network, just to offer a platform where you could connect with other professionals um, like yourself. Um, one of the panelists that we've had in previous events, Monid Hajale, who's a, a great journalist, um, actually said that you can't be what you can't see, right? And I think you can only really dream as far as um, the eye can see inevitably. So um, yeah, that's another reason that we put together the network. Um, and we have, I guess, three major objectives. Um, so one we wanted, like I mentioned, to create a space um, where career advice can be tailored to the Somali experience. I think there's a lot of unspoken rules and games that you need to play to advance in your career. Um, similar, I guess, even to university. I think a lot of the advice that I got um, from the, I went to school in the UK, so a lot of the um, careers advisors wasn't tailored to my experience. I remember I went to um, a banking event and everyone kind of had alcohol and that's something that's <laughs> very much um, a big part of kind of getting ahead in your career in the UK. Um, and that just wasn't my reality, right? I'm not going to network with you over a beer. Um, so that's another reason, kind of one of the things that we're trying to achieve with the network is to connect you to people who look like you and who can give you advice um, that's really tailored to you and um, your background. Number two is to help you build social capital. I think, um, again, the communities that we come from are underrepresented in a lot of ways. And um, for you to get ahead in life, it's really who you know. Um, so we want to help you really from the beginning um, as you kind of progress in your life to be able to um, already start meeting people in these key positions that can help you get further later in life. And lastly is a support network. So again, you can kind of, anytime that you have 
are facing any challenges at work can then connect with people from a similar background as you and maybe hear a little bit about their experience and how they dealt with things. Um, so I think I'm going to wrap things up here. Um, we'd really like to um, hear from you um, and connect with you. So you can find us on Instagram um, and LinkedIn um, and our website has finally launched. I think um, I will wrap up here and pass on to Somali academics. Hi everyone, thank you so much Kule for, uh, for the amazing presentation. Um, first of all, I would also like to thank Anaga Network for collaborating with us and speaking on behalf of Somali academics and we're grateful for this wonderful opportunity. I'm Maimon Jama, I'm the Head of Operations for Somali Academics and I'm also a third year PhD student at Leicester University um, investigating cancer research. Um, so with that taking much of your time, I would like to just uh, quickly a few minutes introduce our network and um, discuss the reasons for setting it up and our future goals. Um, so firstly, before we go into um, um, discussing more about Somali academics, I just wanted to quickly um, discuss this report that was um, published last year uh, by The Leading Roots, and it was titled um, The Broken Pipeline. And it basically highlighted uh, the inequalities and the biases that were present in higher education, specifically at a PhD level. So they found out that the number of studentships that were awarded to black or black students out of the 20,000 um, uh, PhD uh, scholarships that were, that were um, present, only 1.2% were only awarded to black or black black or mixed black or black mixed students um, so we don't really know much about the Somali uh, the number of Somali students that were awarded but we we um, we believe this would obviously be considerably less and therefore so the reasons why this paper was and this study was conducted it revealed that most of the suites, most of the students were often dissuaded from applying for PhD programs because there is a lack of information available to them so uh, because of this study, we decided to address this issue and we held a PhD Insight Day around the same time um, the report was published to discuss further education, what it entails, the challenges and overall PhD life. So following on from this um, event, a lot of Somali students ex expressed great interest in considering postgraduate studies only after speaking to us and we received a number of positive um, feedback which led us to formally set up Somali academics as an official organization um, so one of the, our missions for um, setting up Somali academics and our overall mission is to elevate the pursuit of higher education within our community and to create a community of like-minded professionals all with the common goal of empowering our youth and uh, we're hoping that we create a platform to showcase the success of Somali students, professionals and academics. To, we'll, we'll help organise events, seminars, workshops tailored towards students at various stages of their academic careers. Um, uh, we're trying to build a network of PhD holders and candidates that undergraduates can have access to. And we'll try to encourage, we're hoping to encourage the next generation of Somali students to consider pursuing a PhD in order to combat the lack of representation um, we see amongst PhD holders and academics. And so from our um, setting up, following from setting up that organization, we held two large virtual events throughout this year, which are part of our ongoing series called Beyond Academia. The first one explored the current influential Somali professionals within our community and across various sectors, where they discussed the key practical skills they've developed over the years and provided invaluable advice tailored to their respective careers. Our second event, we collaborated with, um, we collaborated with Bell Forward Hub, and this one was geared towards leadership and we had uh, we brought out several high uh, professionals high profile professionals and discussed leadership roles across various sectors so here are some of the um some of just the speakers that we had for our uh, beyond academia that participated in the beyond academia um um, series and I just wanted to highlight the majority of the speakers um, and the guests are actually Somali and I believe this is very important for Somali youth to see this to inspire them to show them that their fellow Somalis got into their respective fields and achieved their dreams and we're hoping um, this webinar 
uh, inshallah to give them more insight on how to um, um, decide which, which career is more suitable for them. I'm just going to pass over to my colleague Nasra, which is our head of outreach and mashallah she helped design this amazing guidebook and she'll talk about it more. Asalaamu Alaikum guys. Um, so alongside this webinar that you're um, seeing today, inshallah, what we'll have is a guidebook which will cover all of these areas here. Um, and we've collaborated alongside Huddle, the Mental Health Network, um, as well as our Asala Youth for a part on practicing your Deen. Um, and also um, Nafisa's Kitchen, which is uh, who is a food blogger and PhD student on some simple recipes um, to help you keep uh, a nutritious diet while at, whilst at university. So inshallah, um, towards the end of this webinar, please look out on our socials. We'll be uh, posting this PDF um, and share with any prospective university students, inshallah. We hope that it's gonna be of great benefit. Oh, here are our socials, inshallah. So I'm hoping another network are also gonna share it um, and we'll share it on our Twitter and Instagram. Um, do keep a lookout. Thank you so much. I'll hand over to Nashra. <laughs> so Thank you so much. Introduce our guests, inshallah. Thank you so much, Nashra. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you guys can actually see my face. So let me share my video. Hello, Islam alaikum, everyone. Thank you for all joining today. I'm so pleased that we have uh, so many of you joining us. Um, welcome to the Somali Academics Hunt on the Network event. Um, my name is Mariam Dahir and I am the event coordinator at Anaga Network and I, I am also a customer success manager at a technology company. Um, today I would like to introduce our esteemed guest. Our first guest is our uh, Farah and she is a film producer and writer. Her most recent work being Somali Nimal, a documentary with the Guardian and British Film Institute. Um, do you want to just say hello to everyone? Hello everyone, um, I'm so happy to be joining this event. Um, yeah, my name is Awa, you've basically introduced me so I don't think I need to do that. <laughs> but yeah, I'm really excited. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, next we have uh, Zachariah Hersey, he is an entrepreneur whose um, unconventional journey led him to help start Truecaller, an app which connects 2 million users in Africa and the Middle East. Thank you so much Zachariah for joining. Hi guys, thank you for having me. I'm really excited. Next, we have Anissa Ismail, who is the founder of the Unplugged Initiative, which is the world's first ever community centre focused on digital wellness for young children, teens and young adults. She's also an author of a digital detox book called How Electronics Stole Childhood. So that's a great thing if anyone wants to read that. So Anissa, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I think Anissa's actually still on the way, <laughs> so she should uh, be on in like two minutes. Okay, no worries, we'll make sure we get back to her so you can say hello. I did her as panelist, so she should be here. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, so, um, hi Anissa, if you can hear us. Hi, Great. I'm really sorry guys. Hi everyone. Hello, thank you so much for, for joining Anissa. Uh, next we have Abdi Fatah Ali, who is a UK-based medical doctor who recently graduated. We all, he all heard his story on Twitter. If you didn't, I did. Um, he's also a YouTuber and a co-founder of Scope Media. So thank you so much, Abdi, for joining. It's an absolute honor to be here. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Um, and lastly, we have Sa'ad Al, who is a qualified a physiotherapist, a counselling um, psychologist and an advocate for women's health, um, women's well-being and mental health. So thank you so much Saad for joining us today. We're so happy for you to be here. Without further ado, I'd like to get started in today's hot seat q and It's going to be, it's going to be hot and it's going to be fast. So I hope you um, panellists and guest speakers are ready for that. Um, we thought it would be a good idea to have a wheel generator and a timer. So speakers, I hope you're up for the challenge. It's definitely going to be a hot seat q and So we have Nostra who is going to be spinning the wheel and deciding which one of our questions, one of our guests will be answering the question. What we're going to be doing first is spinning the wheel for the question. And then we've got all the panellist names here. So we'll be choosing who answers. <laughs> So without further ado, let's do our first spin. OK, 
Okay, the first question is, were the number of hours you spent at university sufficient to support your revision? So who's gonna answer this question? This is for you. That's right, if you could just go back to the question. So I'll go back to the question, there we yeah. go. Thank you. So I think uh, my cause is a bit a little different to a lot of others. Uh, I did medicine, so I think, yeah, I think we had a lot of hours. Uh, um, so I think it's enough if you're doing medicine or dentistry. Um, you will have enough uh, hospital hours and uh, tutorials and lectures to, to support you with your revision. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, I know that uh, medical students have a lot of hours um, which are spent on university, um, but I, again, I think it is sufficient for you to do your revision. So any you know, future doctors in, the, in this event today, I really hope that um, you can take uh, Take away some things from uh, what, whatever Abu Bakr has been saying today. Thank you, Nashra. On to the next question. Yep. Okay. Next question is: Are you currently working in the field that you studied in? So this is a good question. <laughs> And this is going to be for Oh no, we can't have Abdi Fatah again. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go one more time, guys. Just for the sake of variety. Yeah, it's with me, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, I studied uh, economics with a major in marketing, and currently I'm in tech. So I'm not a, actually de a developer, but most of my work is to deal with operations, to deal with um, people management, and dealing with, you know, trying to have a vision and then getting it to execute it. <clears throat> but I think marketing skills helped because literally every day you need to pitch, you need to pitch to uh, people in the team to get buy internally for your vision. You need to get uh, to pitch to investors. You have to pitch to PR and so on. So technically, I'm not working with it, but at the same time, the skills that I gained from university have helped me being more out there in in, in a sense. So you could say it has been also helpful. Perfect. I definitely agree with you. I think uh, university does help you with. Um... The course you choose doesn't definitely help you with the skills that you do in your current job. So um, anyone who is worried about not getting into a field that they studied in, don't worry, um, that's just life, but you'll be using the same skills that you um, learned in, in university. So thank you so much for that. Okay, next question. is okay. what's the best place to look for support so we see who wants to answer this question <laughs> oh it seems to really like our different doesn't it <laughs> <laughs> okay I'm just, we'll give you this question so what's the best place to look for support at university or in, in life in general? Um, I think to have people or friends that are going through the same thing you are. Um, I know usually a lot of people say uh, your family and friends, but I think people in the same field as you, uh, maybe, you know, in university are the best people to, to ask for support because I think got, they, know, they know exactly what you're going through. Um, I think your family will always support you, but sometimes uh, for for us first generation uh, Somalis born in, in here in Europe, it's a bit difficult because 
you know they don't have that experience uh, um, so I think friends who are in university is what I went for when I was in university so yeah Perfect. Yeah, definitely. Friends and family are always a good support network. And, and later today, actually, so I will be talking about how, where you can seek support for your well-being and mental health. So we will definitely be discussing that topic a little bit further today. Thank you. Um, on to our next question. How much did your university grades matter in terms of securing your first job? Okay, I think this is this is a great question. So whoever gets this uh, can answer this one. Looks like you, Anissa. <laughs> I guess it's my turn. Um, I actually ended up. For me, my story is a little bit different when it came to studying at university. So I left, um, I left the UK and the university in my second year of uni. And so I was working and studying, um, I carried on distance learning. So initially when I went into my first teaching job, um, the grades at my current like university degree did not matter, but my grades and my college diploma did matter. So that was why um, I was able to come along with the experience that I was doing. So for me, it was a bit of a like, I, I don't know if it's fair to even answer this question because it was a different course that I took or uh, a different route that I took because working in a different country and all of that, the rules were a bit different. So um, for me, it didn't matter, but it depends. It really depends on what you're um, studying, I think. Um, and what your first job entails and how much the key I think is how much experience you have while you're studying I think a lot of people um, kind of underestimate the the fact that if you're studying and working in the career path that you want you are more likely to secure a first job that is not only gonna help you set up your career or start in the right you know path but it's gonna help you find something that is definitely best for you so um, did it matter? I don't really know, but the fact that you know you're doing something that you want to do, I think, is the most uh, important part. So, yeah, thank you. You can certainly elevate you when you're going into the job market. So, um, anyone that is, um, you know, worried about you know getting a two two if they graduate, honestly, don't worry. Now, after after you secure your first job with that amazing experience that you had, no one's ever going to be looking at your um, university grades. Um, but, you know, as individuals, you always want to do the best. So whatever you can do, you know, um, by the power of Allah, you, you will do it. So um, inshallah, um, everything will be fine in that regard. But it doesn't matter. But I think if you can um, couple that with a great experience, then that definitely helps. So I really agree with you, Tisa, on that. Thank you so much. Right, next question. Oh, I think I think we've had this one. Let me just remove it. Let's go again. Okay, why do you think networking is important and how can students benefit? So this is another great question. Oh, that's a close one. <laughs> <laughs> I think Awa should, should also. I think Awa should do this. <laughs> yeah, I think I think Awa should. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think networking is a bit of a weird word, um, just because I think when you associate the word networking, it's often associated with like, I don't know. I think of like men in suits standing around trying to like talk to each other about um, their business and trying to like get you to understand what they're doing and stuff but I actually think networking is really really bigger than that I think 
you can network with your friends, you can network with um, the people in your class, you can network with even um, your lecturers and your teachers. Um, I think a massive thing for me during my undergrad was getting to know um, my lecturers, especially my supervisor, because I think in the long term that really helped me, especially when you need references. Um, I always say at least get to know three of your lecturers um, really well so that when you come back for those references it's not awkward because that process is really it can be really hard um, so I think networking is just um, building sort of like a community of people that you feel quite comfortable to contact whenever you feel like it um, depending on what you need at that time so I think throughout your time at university just be sort of be I guess observational when you're talking to people and you know um, just interacting with different people and see like oh is this someone that I could potentially need in the future I know that sounds really transactional but that's maybe you know something that will benefit you in the future so I think that's how I look at networking at least for me. In general what what should the students take from their university experience at you know at minimum should it be that uh -huh. you know they they just get their grades is it you know uh, life experience is it you know making friends just you know, the whole, the whole package. Yeah, so um, I'm a bit older than most of you guys. So I started uni in 2003, so I was 18. So um, there's a lot of things I had to, you know, once I started working, I realized there's a lot of things I could have done better. Uh, for me, it was mostly, ah, oh, I should just go there, get my grades, and then just get out. But I didn't have the opportunity to, you know, network with the students, join the French student organization, build up at least um, reference points. And that actually affected my work in the future where I had to literally rebuild everything, uh, getting that experience, getting, because currently I've seen a lot of people, you know, if they go through a university, they literally have a whole um, backing of you know, students, student organizations, uh, networking availabilities and those type of things, you know. I don't think, if you're already going through uni, I don't think you should just go through it by saying, you know, I just passed. Uh, for example, here in Sweden, university is free. So you don't actually even feel like you're being hurt by it. But, you know, later on I had to go and, you know, um, pay for my executive MBA and then you realize the luxury you had when you were in university earlier that you could have taken advantage of, of all the resources there. So I think just take take it as much as you can and you won't see the results straight away, but in the, in the future, 10, 10 years down the road, you'll be like, yeah, it was actually worthwhile investing some time in university. No, yeah, I agree. So make the most of your uni um, experience. I know it's a bit different this year, um, in COVID, but you can still connect with, um, you know, your, um, you know, your peers and your lecturers. And you know, LinkedIn is big. You know, try and you know have an active LinkedIn profile if you can, and um, just to get yourself out there and connect with them, as many people as possible. So, good luck, to, good luck to people this year. Um, I know it's a hard one, but inshallah, you will, you will get there. Thanks, Natara. Let's go to the next question. Um. Perfect. Do you have any self-study tips that helped you in particular during your time in university? I think this will is a little bit biased. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think uh, this this uh, particular question, um, I think it, it, uh, it's very important because, uh, you know, depending on who you are, you have a different um, study technique. And I think it, it takes a bit of time to figure out um, what technique works perfectly for you. Um, so for me personally, um, 
at the beginning of my university uh, degree, I used to waste a lot of time. So I, I, it, like going to the library used to be like a social event where everyone kind of meets up. Um, and you would be in the library for maybe seven, eight hours and you would do 20 minutes or half an hour's worth of uh, actual studying. So I think towards my second semester, uh, we, we figured out this technique where you, you put a stopwatch on your screen, or an iPad, whatever. Um, and, you know, as soon as you start revising, you, you put that stopwatch on. Um, and as, as soon as you have a break or you start talking to your friends or you, you go for like a little snack break, um, you pause it and it actually gives you the, the uh, specific time or the, the, the amount of time you've actually studied. So you, you might have been there for seven, eight hours and studied for an hour, right? So uh, we can week out, you, you kind of realize how much time you're wasting um, so slowly you start to improve that. So you say, you know what, I, I, I want to do actually three hours worth of work. So you might be for, you might be there for eight hours uh, and do three hours worth, and you just start to improve, and you you realize how much time you're actually wasting. Um, so that's one of the first tips. The second tip I would use was uh, write a topic list um, because you know some sometimes in medicine the, the topics could be a lot. So you write the topic list and you might have 70 or 100 topics um, and you just start from the top and slowly go through each topic uh, at a time. Um, and this weird thing I do is I listen to rainforest or these weird sounds, you know, that are very therapeutic, um, that makes me get into that zone um, and calms me down so I don't have that much uh, stress and anxiety from realizing how much work I, have to, uh, I actually have to do and specifically for me because I procrastinate a lot so uh, you know I kind of leave a lot to, to last minute so yeah that, they're my like main three study tips yeah no perfect I think uh, being a accountable when it when it comes to studying is is uh, good like you said if, if you're only studying if you're in the library for seven hours but only studying for one hour that's, that's a bit questionable so definitely keeping yourself accountable is um is always good so thank you so much for for those tips Okay, so what techniques did you use to keep yourself stress-free? Um, I think it's during during university. I'm just thinking about. <laughs> so um, to keep yourself stress-free. Okay, so I. Um, just genuinely don't deal with stress very well, studying or not studying, I'm just, I cannot handle stress. And I think the earlier you kind of realize those, those kind, kind of pointers for yourself, the better. And um, I remember one of my, um, it was actually in college, one of my um, college teachers used to always say to us, um, take five minutes, tell yourself to take five minutes when you feel like things are being overwhelming or, when you feel like you don't understand something, walk away and then come back to it. And so I found myself just doing that with a lot of different things. Um, thinking about when you are trying to understand a certain subject or understand a certain um, idea, it can be difficult to try and jam it in. And I think Abdul Fatah mentioned about your, your learning techniques and how you're able to just get or take in information everybody takes in information in different ways so having your moment of like okay I, I just need to walk away or whatever works for you for me walking away um in this part of the world going somewhere that I love uh, going there like water or ocean if you're studying somewhere like away from your home um if you can find a little a little piece of or like a place that you find the most peace um, make it a weekly thing where you could just kind of go and check in and just kind of have a moment because yes studying and learning can be overwhelming but I think a lot of mistakes that happen is we we make it our whole life 
um, when we're young and we, we feel like our whole life is connected to this one chapter and really it isn't. So learning to kind of take some moments to just have some downtime, um, indulge in things that you like, um, treat yourself, celebrate your small wins. If you understood a chapter, celebrate it, like let that be something that you, you are proud of. Um, I feel like we're just so used to finishing studies and celebrating the degree. But if you've had a mad week and you've gone through the week on a Friday, let's celebrate it. I'm not talking about like going party, but I'm just saying like have a moment where you're like, you know, can appreciate that. So celebrating the small wins, taking some time to kind of breathe and understand that it is okay that I don't get it now, but I will. And just kind of allowing yourself to naturally kind of get it in the end. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes uh, so much sense. And I think, uh, sometimes when we are stressed we, and then we overcome the feeling of being stressed we don't actually celebrate so I think that's actually a really good good tip so thank you so much for that we do have a, just a few more questions um, so yeah, let's carry on thanks Natura no worries um, just a few more were you able to get support outside of the classroom so i guess this question is more focused around your family and a friend so did you get support um while you were at university from family and friends Um, yeah, definitely for me, I think community was such a massive part of my time at university, especially at Cambridge, just because it was so different from like what I knew. Um, and so seeking out like communities in which um, there was just like, you know, Muslims and black people and even the intersection of Muslim black people was so something I needed so much at the time and it's not really something you think about or at least I thought about when I was studying in London because you know that's so accessible to you um, but also something I would emphasize especially if you live away from home or you're moving away from home for the first time is to go back home as much as, well not as much as possible but just whenever you can um, something that I know a lot of sort of especially Muslim students do is during the Christmas holiday they stay in um, their universities because um, they just don't see the need to go back home and they you know they're not celebrating Christmas but you re-energize so much from going back home and you might think that you are studying more if you are making use of the library when no one is there and stuff but actually just going home and spending time with family and sort of you know just having family cook for you for the, you know after a long time cooking for yourself and stuff like that that really helps you, first of all, your mental health, but also it helps you re-energize for the new semester. So I think um, family and finding out and, you know, looking for communities that can support you during this time are like both a really intrinsic part of like your university experience and something you should keep in mind when you're there. No, I absolutely agree with you. Um, I definitely uh, did that when I was at university and also um, looking back on my uh, time at university, I wish I had more Somali people to connect with outside of the classroom. Um, so um, it, just being on this platform today and just seeing all the Somali people here and, you know, we can all connect together and inshallah, you know, the, the people who are uh, students can connect with each other today and, you know, having that support is important and uh, definitely re, re energizing yourself for the next semester is important so thank you so much Hawa for that. Next um, no, it's been a while. Okay, what's the best way to make use of your free time? This is a good question. <laughs> I'm 
Should I answer them? Um, so I guess the the best, I, I don't know, I guess the more um, sort of professional way of answering this would be like um, have productive procrastination um, sort of things to do. So if you feel like you are working on something and you want to spend time doing something else, then do something positive. Like maybe if you're learning to play the piano, then work, work on learning the piano. Or if you want to exercise, exercise. But honestly, I don't really think... Um, there is sort of one answer for this. I think it just depends on the person, um, which I think are the answers to a lot of these questions, but um, just do things that you enjoy doing. Um, and yeah, just sort of go from there. Yeah, no, absolutely. Do what um, you enjoy doing and maybe also try something new um, at university, maybe get into, you know, boxing you know do we'll do some different activities that the university offer or you know during covid if you can't do that maybe you know try and meet you know uh, with some people from university you know obviously uh, within the social distancing rules um and definitely you know try and find some activity that you can do then i think that will definitely help with uh, your well-being as well during this time so we do have a few questions from the audience that we're going to um, answer in the next couple of minutes, but we're just going to get through the last couple of questions on the wheel and then we will pass it over to the audience. So thank you everyone um, asking questions. Feel free to in the Q&A box in Zoom. Thank you so much. Happy to spin the wheel, Nashua. So what are a few things that would have advanced your experience at university that you did or would have done if you could go back? That was close. Yeah, <laughs> that was close. Um, I... I think that, again, it really depends on the person, um, this question. But there's two things that I think I would have done more if, or I would have, one thing I did and one thing I would have done if going back. Um, I would have spent a lot more time getting to know um, some more of my professors. I think I spent, um, everyone kind of has like their favorite subject or their favorite um, class. So I went and I always kind of stuck to that. So I would have spent more time getting to know like professors, getting to know um, um, their journeys and like how they, you know, got into the career that I'm wanting to get into. Um, the other thing that I would have probably done is um, probably chosen a university that wasn't so far. I think the travel time and all of that, it really does take a toll on your well-being and it does take a toll on you know um you as as a person and how your productivity i mean now of course everything is different with um covid and everything that's happening um but it is really important to kind of know your own boundaries and what you can handle and what you can take and sometimes we make decisions especially as 18 year olds we were given like such a huge decision surrounding our freedom that sometimes you know the question is are we ready to even make these decisions but that's a whole other topic but coming back to this it literally for me i feel like sometimes i would have maybe gotten a different um, opinion from someone else and just kind of seen um, what would have been best in the long run because it can be grueling if you are traveling an hour and a half two hours every day um, and on top of your revision and on top of everything else you've got you've got to also do so yeah thank you that's really um really good of you to reflect on that and i think everyone who's in the position of working well you know studying from home during covid i think I think now they're thinking about you know other things <laughs> so um it's good you mentioned that and hopefully you know you guys are finding ways to keep yourself occupied and not you know and active even though you're you're um you know studying from home all the time so thank you anisa
we just have a couple more questions um, before we start taking questions from the audience i can see we've got a couple of questions in the chat box so just the last few Okay, so how do you dis discipline yourself and avoid procrastinating? So um, I think I've dis actually answered this very well. So being accountable and you know timing yourself is a good it's a good tip. So uh, let's see who if, if anyone else has an, uh, another answer to this. Um, not sure. Let's just see if someone else has a different viewpoint. <laughs> okay, I think we'll just go on to the next question because I think I'm just happy to answer this one already. I'd just like to add to 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 that. Um, basically, there's this book called uh, the Two Minute Rule um, by David Allen, um, and the Two Minute Rule is basically where if you have a task at hand which takes two minutes or less um you should just do it so getting into that mindset of you know uh, is this two minutes and if it's two minutes just doing that task at hand um because that's how the the procrastination starts you think i'll do it later and then something you're meant to do tomorrow you you say i'll do it next week and next week and monday never comes so it's like just like that's one of the main techniques I use now. The two minute rule. Just wanted to add that. To the mix. No, that's good. I've actually heard of the two minute rule, and I've uh, I tried it a few years ago, and it's actually really good. So everyone, get your hands on that book if you can. It's a really good book. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I think uh, we have one more question, Natura. Yeah, one last question that's already come up. <laughs> we don't need to spin the wheel for it. Okay. Uh, one second. Okay, I'm gonna to have to do it one more time. Okay, what was your first experience living away from home like? How often did you go back to see your family? So our kind of also did mention this a little bit, um, but it would be good to maybe just open this up to anyone who did live um, away from home. Um, maybe a different hour. What would you say to that question? Um, I lived I lived away from home for for nine years. I think so. The last time I was at home was two thousand eleven. So I did a degree here in the UK and then went abroad. Uh, and it it was it was difficult. I'm not gonna lie to you. The first few years I was very homesick. Uh, I was going off, uh, going back home, like I was saying, very frequently. So probably, I was in Yorkshire, so once a, once a week, like every weekend, I would go home. Uh, and then the second, third year, I think, it, you know, it, it would be like every couple of weeks, once a month. Um, so whenever it's possible, I, I would say, I would recommend like going back home. Um, it's, it's tough because... Um, you have so much freedom at 18 and so much money um, from student finance that you, you like you can do whatever the hell you want you know what i mean um and this is the time when you literally start figuring yourself out like what your strengths what your weaknesses are your friendship groups are very important because i think they they kind of make or break you don't matter who you are and how um stubborn you are they they will have an effect on you. So having the right um, friendship group and networking, and you know having people around you that are like minded and want the same thing and same type of experience uh, you want from from experience, it's very important. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone else have something to add to that. Um, I kind of wanted to add to that as well. Um, I think for young, I'm gonna I'm gonna speak to my sisters. Um, for young Muslim women, um, especially Somali women, it's really 
uh, a taboo to, to leave and study or to leave and work abroad. It's happening a lot more now, but when I left in 2011 as well, it was, um, it was really unheard of and it was really difficult. So I think if you are able to, first of all, do it and study away or, or work away from, from your family, I think it adds to building your character, adds to building you as a person. You experience so many things that I could not even um, put into words. Like, as Abdul Fatah was saying, you have all this freedom and then you have all this money and then it's just like all of a sudden you've got to manage all of that without a playbook on how to do it because the generation before us probably wasn't thinking the same the same way we were so i would say if you can come back home as often yes you're going to feel homesick you're going to feel all types of way but also just to kind of enjoy the journey um and enjoy the the process of learning about yourself um figuring out how you can deal with other people other nationalities other other countries and other ways that they they operate because we are we are pretty sheltered when we're at home and so when you leave that comfort zone when you leave that shelter you genuinely learn so much about yourself that you will not have learned in that in that space so i just wanted to, to add that Thank you, Anissa. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. Um, it's definitely an uh, experience worth having. Um, so yeah, really appreciate your feedback on that. Um, it looks like we answered all the questions on the reel. Um, Awa, did you have anything to add? Um, I was just also actually going to add that like, we can't ignore just how important family is in our community and just what an, like, massive impact it has on our lives. And I think for a lot of students, so I, moved out I guess at a later age I, I moved out when I was 21 because I literally had to because the unit was so far but if I could have chose if, if, if it was my choice I would have stayed at home for sure um, because for me I did um, I did sort of have a lot of um, difficulties actually when I moved out for the first time especially with my mental health and sort of being away from home for the first time and I thought because I was 21 and I was older I would have maybe been more prepared, but I don't think you're ever prepared when you're moving away from home for the first time. Um, so I would definitely say that like, it's a massive, honestly, culture shock <laughs> moving away. I know it's, it's just like moving to a different university and it's like, it's not a big deal technically, but it is like a culture shock. It's like, you need to completely reorganize yourself and reorganize everything you know um especially coming in, if you're coming from a big family you know you're just used to always having people around that you can talk to and share your ideas with and share any worries you have with and then suddenly now you're alone in this room it can be a really hard time so um yeah i just wanted to mention that because i think it's definitely something that impacts everyone no i absolutely agree with you i think family is a big um, so that they are your support network and your close support network so it's really important to have them there and for, for, for those people who you know have moved away and they're, they're struggling um, definitely take that advice of these guys you know go go home as much as possible um, and you know especially during Covid I know that most of you guys are locked down in your rooms in, in some areas of the country so um, yeah speak to your families as much as possible um, and you know hopefully if you can if you can leave um then i would recommend doing that uh, whenever you can so thank you so much guys for for the great and insightful answers to these questions we are now going to move on to the q a we have a few questions from the audience and um, for those of you who uh, who raised their hands on the zoom if you could please um add your question to the q a box that would be great and so now I'm just going to share these questions with, with you. Um, let's see. So there was one question. Someone said, is university better than an apprenticeship if you're trying to uh, study civil engineering? So this, this might not be, I don't know if this, um, you know, is a good question for, um, panelists but uh, generally yeah, I think I'm just going to answer this um, I think um, if the apprenticeship is um, sort of the industry that you're looking to go with they have they have a good um, structure you know they 
you're able to get the certification that you need to be a civil engineer, then that's definitely a great option. University is very practical and in that sense, and you're able to, to get it. I think the, I think the question, my answer to this would be to, to do a lot of research. Um, apprenticeships are definitely great and, you know, not everyone is built for university and they, 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 they like just doing things hands on. So I definitely think, um, you know, doing your research would be, would be the, my answer to that. But if anyone else in the panellists or the guests have a, an answer to this question, that would be, that'd be great. Um, I've got a brother who, who studies civil engineering and uh, there's, they're also in a group of uh, Somalis who is a network of engineers. So whoever that is, if they can like, just message me or DM me. I'm just getting them in contact with engineers, Somali engineers, which is like, I think the best thing to do because I, I don't know a lot about civil engineering. Yeah. Thank you. So next question is, how did you decide what you wanted to study in the future? So this was from uh, Ridwan. Is there anyone there? Anyone? Yeah. Um, I don't actually think I really knew when I was leaving college. Um, I think I always sort of kind of wanted to do journalism. And so I went to do my first degree in that. But it was only actually after I sort of did my first degree and I was at the university that I was truly able to explore what I wanted to study. Um, so I, I would go to like different lectures a lot, um, especially like I've always loved sociology. So I would go to a lot of like sociology lectures and just um, sit in with some of my friends. But it was only then that I was like, oh, I, I really like research actually. And like, although I like writing and although I like, you know, journalism in that sense, I don't really enjoy studying it. And so um, after my time at university i then sort of then figured out exactly what i wanted to do but i definitely didn't know when i was sort of like 18 at all thank you so much uh, there, we have another question i think a really interesting one um someone mohammed amin asked did any other current speakers face a time where they questioned the degree they were doing and how do you convince your parents uh, degrees other than medicine, engineering, etc., are still good and useful degrees? <laughs> I think this is a good question. Good, good answer. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Because <Yeah. laughs> definitely there's always those expectations that you have to deal with, especially as parents regarding, you know, their go-to uh, degrees are always medicine and engineering. And I think probably until like well, my dad still kept on insisting. So you will never ever fully uh, convince them, but I think being very consistent in what you want. And I knew the things that I was not good at. I was definitely not good at math or I was not good at, um, you know, uh, at least those fields regarding uh, um, engineering and medicine. But I also uh, had a very uh, interesting journey because <clears throat> even after getting a degree, and I think, the generation now, like we have gone through financial crisis in 2008 and now COVID, that um, the day you actually get the degree is also like you need to fully prepare yourself that things have changed and you need to add the extra to uh, achieve what you wanted. And for me, when I graduated, it was the, during the 2008. 300 jobs and never was able to get the interview and so on. And a lot of doubt happened where I was thinking, I should have taken the engineering degree, I should have taken medicine because that's always, um, the demand is always there. But someone in economics is very, or marketing is very, you're very disposable. So um, I think for you guys to understand is like, you're, you're gonna work for the next 30, 40 years. So even if you don't figure things out, don't you don't have to convince anyone. Just follow your dreams, be consistent about it, and you'll execute. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. Yeah, and 
these are hard times for everyone but um you know carry on with what you're doing and inshallah you know everything will work out for you guys um so thank you thank you for answering that question so we are going to move away from the questions so i really apologize to everyone who did um put in some questions we are going to um get back to you once the SMT call is over i'm now going to pass over to natural to introduce our last um, guest speaker inshallah thank you um, so our last guest speaker um, is Saad Ala, who is a qualified psychotherapist, counsellor and psychologist and advocate for women's health. Um, she's also founded the Hajal Mental Health Network, um, and that's what she'll be speaking about today, inshallah, how to um, keep up your mental health while at university and just generally, I think we can all benefit um, whatever stage of our lives we're in. So if I can just introduce Saad. Thank you. How are you doing, everybody? I'm sorry, I come late. I was doing a session. Wow, I feel old, by the way. I don't know how all of you guys are going. Well, thank you for, and I really, really, what I want to say it, with my broken English, thank you for the job you're doing for all the students, especially. I wish somebody told me things before I go to university. And I am somebody, if that sounds really old. I think I'm in education more than 22 years. Really, half of my life is in education. And it sounds really, it's hard. It's, it's the most hard place to be in, education-wise. And with all with the background I have, actually, I studied three different degrees. That mean I've been in education in different ways, especially when you are Somali. You're moving around, you learn every day new language, you need to adapt in every culture you go in. For is a lot being asked about you when you are Somali. Just to be Somali, it is a lot of things underneath that coming. That being said, and I wanted to start with something really interesting. And people, uh, I'll say, what kind of thing I can say to you today? And I think one of the things I will begin, you need to know, uh, for instance, when you start university, what is happening? When you start university, you are exiting adolescent to the adult. And that means you're starting to figure out your identity in, inside your family self. Forget about any outside the universe. You created this adult who making you identity for the self. And the other thing will happen is your support system is changing. Whereas before your family was looking for you different way, they'd be there for you. You will look, at, if, if you do mistake, everybody will say to you, oh, you're still young. The day you just entered the university door, like I feel like our parents, they will say, oh, I did my job, goodbye. That is, <laughs> now it's your journey, you need to start. And that is what is happening. And that is a sense, the sense, it gives you a sense of loneliness because you need to figure out new system for yourself. And that is put a lot of pressure in your emotion and your well-being. And that's one thing we need to be considering. You need to know what is this thinking happening outside where I am. The other thing is, is going to happen is a change. And I'm really sorry for people and myself too. I'm still a student. And, and sometimes I lecture, but I'm in the both sides, whether I'm lecturing in uni or I'm in student. And the reason is, is it's really hard time to see then you scream and just listen to somebody talking for the laptop all day long. For people who go in university right now, I think you never hear maybe this word. You are in grief stage. People think grieving is when somebody dies. My grieving is you have a lot of things to do, sense of closure. But you was in and you left your school, your college, whatever. But you never had that sense of closure this year. It feel with you sense, not sure where I am. That is a lot of emotion to bear with that. For you are in the stage of the grieving. When we grieve, grief have different stage. Acknowledgement, that is the first step of that. Well, when we grieving, while we, actually, what are we grieving for? for? And the other thing is happening, I think, and we, you need to maybe perhaps worry about it is, you're going to create 
you lose in creating your social skill as adult. It will limit you this year because you, you are in this cream, you sit in your home and some people, family can be amazing. Sometimes family can be most horrible place to be in and uni was your way out. And maybe this place you're not able to do that too. And some people, they have big family, they not have that own space or personal space. And I think with so many community in our culture, while we struggle something called personal space, because we come in for collect culture. When you come in collect the culture, yo, everybody feels same. If you complain, you say, well, I'll come out to that. Why you do that? Everybody is like, <laughs> before your mom answered, oh, it did not sound way to But you are actually, your emotion is not a title for you. You are to title to all society and the family, how they feel. But that is just give you not much option. And that is something you need to be aware. And I think as society, it have a lot of impact. And I'm, in my therapy room, I saw everything. I think I saw everything. I can't say that. And my young clients is six years old. To the, my old clients is 74 years old. When I say I see everything and I see how the small thing family can do and they're not aware of it. And a small thing can a school do to you. I'm, I'm telling you how it's the truth is. I'm somebody, I develop anxiety from, from education for a long time. And the reason is you are black. And don't forget, we, I don't want to sugarcoat it for you. Your race, you will have impact on some of the, if you go in for subject where it's not that much black people, you will feel outside in the sense of emotion, sense of aloneness, it will come to you. And that is really have impact on your well-being too. In my uni, you are your own. This is like you, the education system or family system, it never prepare you. Like you, you never swim before. And somebody said to you, go swim. What are you going to expect? You're going to swim like, and go on the other side without nothing? No. Because what happened, that is where you figure out if something, I don't want you to feel shame if you, to do anything. And I'm telling you, I'm talking to you and I'm studying doctor, I'm dyslexia and I always own it. And the reason I tell you that I share this with you, don't feel shame because your mind, it works different than anybody else. And each individual have their own brain to work on it. That is one thing I want you to, to acknowledge that. The other thing is it going to happen is it's where I belong. When your brain is this, this cognitive process in your brain, you need to tell your brain, justify, before you go to the stage of anxiety and panic attack, oh, because I'm frustrated, I'm not understanding this lecture today. But you justify one emotion. You're not going to call all of the negative experience you had in one day and it will ruin the whole day for you. For it's good to justify your emotion right then and right then. Thinking I will never do this. I will never able to do it. If I, today you ask me, I love research. I love everything to do statistics. I will do data, I will analyze and say, oh, okay, this is what is it. And because before I didn't know how to attack, and really tip my supervisor gave me, said to me, you need to look at paper, any study, what the story they tell you and what the truth, how they know the truth, the data, the number they give you, that is the truth of the, what they're going to say. And you just, that is why you criticize, you know, you take it or you leave it. And now I don't look at this paper, no more statistic and number and research. This is a big language they use it. I don't know. I use my own language. I say, are you going to lie to me or are you going to tell me the truth? That is how I look paper studies. For, and I see that for, I name things, different names, because my brain always says it. Statistic, I would say, oh no, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> But because my brain associated in the beginning with my study is something horrible. For I'm reacting, the condition I give to my brain, this is something difficult I cannot do. 
For what happened is you associate with this, I uh, think, that statement. My brain, the our human brain, the way we design our brain is to protect you. But what happened if you sell sad, you tell your brain, I'm in a good place, you need to protect me everything. But your brain, it will not going to focus analyzing, do the homework for you or function or you know, anything you do. It will only focus, be alert that moment. But now, if you justify to your brain saying, actually, no, 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 I'm not, I'm, I'm in a safe place. It just this lecture today, I didn't understand it. And this subject, it kind of challenged for me. The language you're using on yourself is important. If you always saying, somebody saying to yourself, oh, I'm idiot. You, you, you just telling your brain, oh, by the way, don't do that work because I say myself, I'm idiot. And that is what we look at it. That is what you give into your brain to respond to it. Your brain is, don't forget the laptop, the digital we have, is human brain who created. That means your brain more smart than anything you study. That is simply go. It don't go more than that. And that is why you need to be always a bit aware about that. And the other thing is, is where you are stand, what is this happening in that moment for you in your brain? But your well being going back is how you're interpreting things. And and I want you to be aware the language you're using on yourself, and I want to you be aware your environment. And and that same thing, I want you to be aware who's the people have impact on you. And in university, they have a lot of counsel. And I don't want you to take the stigma in our culture world about mental health, talking about it and well-being. Always it's okay to say I'm not okay today. I need a little help in the way. And believe me, university is, is this place where you develop your social skill, you develop, you becoming the other you want. And I know some of us work and sometimes studying and so but it can be journey, but jo join the journey with challenges coming with. And the same times, if you don't look after yourself, no one going to do that for you. And other thing is name the things one by one, say, it will impact you as, and the truth is, is the way it is. If you are a black student, you will have some change in some course. And that is the truth way it is. You cannot change the system one day. But the only system you are able to change is the way you react and to think and how this emotion, how this is can impact on you. And I want you to be aware of that. For, yeah, for I wish you all of you the best. And, and please don't feel you are, if you feel alone sometimes, and believe me, study show, University students, they have a lot high for depression, anxiety, all this, because you're going to do something. There is sense of pressure, expectation, and sense I should pass, and all of this is top of your assignment. But take a step back and say, you know what? And ask your question, why are you doing your degree actually? Uh, always people they say, oh, I'm going to do that. I say, why are you doing this degree? And don't forget, I ended for the day, thousand people can have degree. My one thing separate people have the same degree as you is the passion. Do something you have passion because when some days you come, you're not able to do it. You get the passion, it will make you survive. But that is the only thing I can say to you. Yeah, and I think you guys, if you have any question, you can ask. Jazakul Khair Saad for your really insightful message. Um, I'm sure everyone will, inshallah. Um, I think we're going to message on socials from now on. So any further questions that anyone has, if they don't um, want to pop up on the chat box, then you can message Saad, I'm sure, on your socials, inshallah, or message Hadal. Um, so I'll, inshallah, we'll tweet out their socials. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank all our attendees and our speakers. We really appreciate your time. Um, early this morning. Um, I think this has been a really, really helpful webinar, inshallah, for anyone um, attending university or anyone already at university. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Um, and the university guide uh, will be published 
just soon after this webinar, inshallah, on our social media, please have a look out on our Twitter, um, Facebook and Instagram. We'll be publishing it alongside Anaga. Um, so please have a look out for that. Hadal also have a piece in there which they dedicated to looking after your mental health if you weren't able to, to make notes on um, what Saad was saying. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, and Jazakallah Khair for joining.